Sweet Galileo. Make new grants. Okay, there's a lot to explain right off the bat. The orchestral sounds that you hear are coming from Logic Pro's stock Mellotron plugin. I'd love to have a real Mellotron, but pff, I don't know, man. If you don't already know, the Mellotron is this keyboard from the 60s that plays a tape recording of a sound when you press a key. It's a great way to get a really old recording sound, uh, if you're okay with it sounding kind of robotic. That mix between old and robotic is uh, perfect for Opraville, so I'd say I'm quite a fan. You might also be a fan, but uh, maybe you just didn't know what this instrument was called. Like, you might have heard it in Strawberry Fields by the Beatles, or Nights in White Satin by the Moody Blues, or Space Oddity by David Bowie. Uh, lots of good songs use it, actually. So back to my track. Uh, on top of the Mellotron samples, I put some advertisement-style narration that's done by a text-to-speech module from the 80s called Deck Talk. Explore the stars. You probably recognize that sound, too. It's uh, most famous for being Stephen Hawking's voice. The Mellotron and Deck Talk are both coming out of something called a ultrasonic parametric speaker array. That sounds like some made-up sci-fi techno babble, but it's a real thing, and it's actually pretty crazy how it works. Each one of these little things is a speaker, and they're all playing the same sine wave. When you have a sine wave coming from two sources, they interfere with each other to create what's called an interference pattern. That means, uh, based on where you are in relation to the speaker, the sine waves might cancel out, making the music quiet, or add together, making the music loud. If you only had two sources, the loud and quiet areas would alternate, but the goal of a parametric array is to create a single spot where the signal is loud and to make it quiet everywhere else. That's why this is sometimes called a sound laser, uh, because it makes a beam of sound as opposed to a normal speaker that just lets the sound go everywhere. In order to make the sound travel straight like a laser, uh, we need a lot more sound sources to cancel out all these other bright spots. That's why this parametric speaker has so many little speakers. Look how sensitive it is to where I point it. It really is like a sound laser. It's very strange to hear in person. Like, if I hold the speaker right in front of my face, but I point it at the wall, it just sounds like it's coming from the wall. James Bond would probably use it to make it sound like his voice is coming from another room or something. But actually, the fact that it's a sound laser is not even the craziest part. These speakers are each playing a sine wave that's uh, so high-pitched, no human could possibly hear it. So then, how do we hear it? It's because the air itself begins to fail. At the center point, where all the sound waves from all the speakers add up constructively, you get a very loud sound. Actually, if I put my hand in front of it uh, pretty close, I can actually feel the sound. It's pretty hard to explain. It doesn't feel like uh, putting your hand in front of a subwoofer. It feels more like this warm, tickly kind of sensation. The sound is so high-pitched and so loud, the air is being requested to move extremely fast, and long story short, it uh, can't keep up and the air itself distorts the sound. That's pretty weird. We're used to amps and speakers being pushed super hard to make them distort, but uh, I'm telling you the air is being pushed so hard that it distorts the sound. Okay, so the air is distorting the sound. How does that mean you can hear anything? Well, I'll explain. All of these speakers are playing a very high frequency sine wave like this one. Let's say what we want to hear is this lower frequency. What we do is we let the lower frequency signal control the volume of the high frequency signal. This is called amplitude modulation because we're modulating the amplitude of our carrier wave with the signal we actually want to hear. That's actually how AM radio works. Amplitude modulated AM. Anyway, we still wouldn't be able to hear this sound because it's essentially just turning up and down the volume of a frequency that we can't hear. The circuitry in your AM radio does something called demodulation to extract this lower frequency from the high frequency one. For a parametric speaker, the air itself actually is doing the demodulation. Uh, no circuit required. Okay, remember when I said the signal is essentially just a high frequency signal being turned up and down in volume? Well, if I'm trying to be technically correct, 
When we modulate a signal, we actually change the frequency composition. In this example, we have a 100,000 hertz carrier wave, which is too high to hear, and a 3,000 hertz signal, which sounds like this. If we modulate the 100,000 hertz signal with the 3,000 hertz signal, we get something that looks like this. But if we do a Fourier transform on this, which is just fancy math talk for measure the frequency, uh, we actually find we no longer have a 100,000 hertz or 3,000 hertz. Now we have a 97,000 hertz and a 103,000 hertz signal. When the Fourier transform is analyzing which frequencies are present in a signal, it's actually telling you which frequencies add up to get your signal. But when we modulate 3,000 hertz with 100,000 hertz, we actually multiplied the signals. So in reality, neither 100,000 hertz or 3,000 hertz exist in this signal anymore. But we can use those numbers to calculate which frequencies do exist there. You just take your original frequencies and you add them, which gives us 103,000 hertz. And 97,000 hertz is just 100,000 hertz minus 3,000 hertz. OK, it might sound like I'm getting too in the weeds, but I promise this is relevant. So to summarize, we modulated an ultrasonic sine wave with our audible signal, which created a signal that's actually two ultrasonic frequencies added together. By the way, don't be afraid when I say two signals added together. If you play two sounds at the same time, those signals are literally mathematically just added together. It's nothing fancier than that. So we have two ultrasonic signals added together coming out of our speaker array. The array makes it so the sound from each speaker adds together constructively at the center point. Think about how loud your phone speaker gets. Each one of these speakers is bigger and louder than your phone speaker, and since we have 48 of them, which are adding constructively, multiply that by 48. So the sound right in front of the speaker is so loud and high-pitched, the air fails as a medium and starts to distort. Well, guess what distortion does? Distortion demodulates. Here are two sine waves with no distortion at 800 hertz and 1000 hertz. If we just look at the 1000 hertz and turn on some distortion, we get the harmonic series, which is just multiples of the fundamental frequency. So 1000, 2000, 4000, 6000, etc. But what's important here is that we only add higher frequencies. That's what distortion does to sine waves. OK, so let's go back to 800 and 1000 hertz being played at the same time. Now I'm going to turn on the distortion. Look at that. We get lower frequencies. And look at the lowest one. It's 200 hertz, which is the difference between our original signals, 1000 hertz and 800 hertz. So that means distortion will cause the appearance of a lower frequency that's equal to the difference between the original two frequencies. So in our case, the signals from all of our speakers added at this particular location to be so loud that the air started to distort our two ultrasonic frequencies, which created a tone that's low enough pitch for us to hear. That's crazy. If you're really into signal processing or math and you've been paying super close attention, you might have noticed there is an issue here regarding the pitch of the demodulated tone. But I'm going to try to avoid getting into the weeds more than I already have. Maybe we can start a discussion in the comments, so if people want to dig a little deeper, they can go look there. So that's all the interesting stuff in the first 10 seconds of the song. Uh, next, I play some chimes and wave around the parametric speaker as a way to give it some personality. Then that leads into a choir section, which I would consider the centerpiece of the album. Well, this is just the first time we'll hear it. It'll be a reoccurring theme, and I guess I would actually consider the centerpiece to be this melody in a different song. The choir sound is a mixture of AI voice transfer and some robotic sounding samples from my own voice. For the samples, I just recorded myself singing every note for my entire vocal range, and then I just assigned it to their appropriate note on this keyboard. Here's what that sounds like after I did some processing to make it sound more robotic. Uh, 
So that's layered with this stretched out and pitched version of my AI choir. This uh, AI choir actually makes more of a grand appearance on a later song, so I'll explain it in more detail there. I'll just say that every single individual voice in this choir is my own, and the program I used did not do a great job at keeping the pitch correct. So step one was to record every person's part, not every section, every person, and step two was pitch correct every person. Maybe that doesn't sound like a lot of work, but do you know how big choirs are? They probably have a plugin now that will just turn one voice into a whole choir section with perfect pitch, but when I did this, it was brutal. Okay, next we have the graphics synth do a THX style slide into a huge rumbling chord. The graphics synth is too much to explain in this video, so I'll do it in a different video. Finally, we end with some tribal chant samples that I've pitched around to sing my own melodies. And then that leads into the next song where that technique is used a bunch. And that's it. I don't think anything in the song justifies an isolated track, so I'll probably skip that unless people specifically request it. If you'd like to hear this track without me interrupting it, I'll put a link in the description. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it. I'll see you next time.